Amen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for singing. Musicians, thank you for your work. Brother Pat, we appreciate it, too. Uh, Brother Pat is right. This morning was a special service. It was. You know, you don't have those all the time. Some of you have been going to church for a long time. A long time. <laughs> Not every service is that special. That was a special service this morning. It was wonderful. Um, you can't make every service that special or else the special ones aren't special. Does that make sense? I heard someone say, well, I come to church and I, I don't even remember what the service was all about. Uh, but we still need them. In fact, that one preacher responded back. He said, do you remember every meal your wife has cooked? The answer is no. no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he gets some points today, man. He is good. But we need them. You know, you need them. You don't remember every meal, but you need it. Uh, but every so often you get that one meal that's like, wow. You know, it's memorable. And I think this morning was sort of like that. By the way, I'll remind you that we do post our services on YouTube. They're live on YouTube uh, during the service time, and then we archive them there. And then usually we'll, uh, within a short amount of time, we'll, we'll cut out just the, we'll just put the message part there only. And we also put some specials on there as well from the services uh, instead of just the whole service as a, as a whole, the congregational singing announcements and offering. We try to cut that out and just put some specials in there and uh, the message. But... Uh, this morning was a wonderful, wonderful service, and uh, certainly one that I'll remember, uh, having the two African pastors with us this morning. It was a real treat. And the music, everyone that took part in the music this morning, youth choir, adult choir, the specials, it was all good, and I praise the Lord for it. Thank you for your work uh, in putting all that together. Well, parents, uh, how many times when you had young children, you said to your children, watch where you're going? Children have a way of just walking and not looking. Am I right? They're walking along. You know, they're trying to keep up with you. And, uh, you know, if say you're at, at the zoo or at some kind of big gathering and you've got all your children around you, they'll, they'll bump into a dozen people because they're just sort of distracted. And uh, I want us to go to a text in Luke chapter 9 tonight. Luke chapter number 9. I've titled this message, Look Where You're Going. Luke chapter number 9. I'll start with verse 57, and I'll end with verse 62. The Bible says, and it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. But let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. When I, every time I read this verse, every time, every time I read Luke 9.62, my mind goes back to when I was kneeling at an altar, surrendering my life to preach the gospel. 
It was the early 90s. I was in a Sunday night church service. And God had already been working on my heart. And at the invitation time, I got out of my seat, made my way to the front, and Bob Folger met me. He's in heaven now. Bob Folger met me there at the front. He said, what are you coming forward for? I said, I'm surrendering my life to preach or do whatever God wants me to do. He said, come on up to the altar. We went up to that altar. I sort of regret we don't have altars like we used to. I think we should bring them back. Uh, in some ways, I regret making this platform the way we made it. Not much space to kneel up here. I, I promise you, next time we redo it, there's going to be more space to kneel. We knelt there at the altar. He took out his Bible and opened up to Luke chapter number 9. And he read verse 62 to me. I'll never forget it. And I know he read it to probably a dozen or a hundred other people when you work at an altar like that. But it, it took a lodging place in my heart. He said, so you're surrendering your life to preach or serve the Lord or whatever he wants you to do? I said, I am. He said, well, I want to read this verse to you. He said, no man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. And I remember what he said. He said, don't look back. That's what he said. We prayed. And that was it. Want any special words? No hocus pocus, no shazam. It was just, here's the scripture, and don't look back. If you're going to put your hand on that plow, don't look back. It's interesting the scripture doesn't say, don't go back. Have you ever thought about that? In our text, there was three individuals who said to Jesus, I'll follow you any place. I'm in. Wherever you go, I'll go. Whatever you do, I'm with you. I am sold out and I'm in. And after those three gave their excuses on why there was restrictions or parameters on their commitment, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Why say look and not go? It's amazing how time flies, isn't it, church? <clears throat> 20 years ago, I was licensed to preach the gospel, 1997. It's amazing how two decades can fly by, right, Sarah? Just, just like that, two decades. And um, something's been happening, and it's a little bit weird. Some preachers and Christian workers are coming to me and Sarah asking for encouragement and advice. And I'm thinking, you got to go to somebody older than me. you got to find somebody. <laughs> I know that I'm not an old preacher, but I guess I'm beginning to realize I'm not a young one either. Oh, boy. It's a tough realization when you get to that point, I guess. Who am I to encourage someone? What am I supposed to say? My mind goes back to Bob Folger at an altar who just simply said, don't look back. You know, Christianity doesn't have to be deep, you know? Christianity doesn't have to be something that's confusing or that is a whole bunch of, of, uh, of uh, confusing uh, statements and doctrines. And There's a lot of doctrine in the Bible, but there's simplicity in the Word of God too. Solomon told his son this, My son, attend to my words. Just listen as I read this. and It's found in the book of Proverbs. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. I thought that was interesting. Solomon said to his son, Keep my sayings and don't let them leave your eyes. Would you tell your kids, Obey my commandments and don't let them leave your eyes? But Solomon, none of the inspirations, God's focusing on the eyes, where you look. 
And he says here, For they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Now listen to this. Let thine eyes look right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet. Let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. I read a story this week of a man who was remembering back when he was a boy. He lived on a farm. And uh, he said, I would ride on the fender of the tractor with my dad. My dad would be plowing the fields, working the fields with the, with the uh, tractor and from an early age, four or five, six years old, sitting on the fender with my dad. He says, I'll never forget the season when we were getting the tractor ready, pulling it out of the barn, greasing up the wheels and getting everything prepared and the plow on the back. We, we were waiting for the snow to melt off and for the, for the uh, ground to dry up because then it would be time to plow. And he said, my dad was out there getting the tractor all ready, and he said to me, he said, son, get up there and pull the tractor out. The boy was all excited, pulled the tractor out, and he had a feeling that his dad was going to let him do some extra work, not just sit on a fender. So his dad gave him some instructions, and they went out into the field with that plow on the back all lubed up and greased up and adjusted. And the dad said, son, you want to plow this ground? The boy was so excited, so excited to plow the ground. And his dad said, now there's one key thing about plowing this ground. The first row is the most important. Now most of us dads would do the first row ourselves. And then say, look, now just keep your wheel over here in this other row because that will keep you sort of straight. But this young man, John, was so excited, dad said, you're going to plow the first row. I want you to learn. So this young boy, maybe nine or ten years old, got up in that tractor seat and got everything prepared and got himself adjusted and he was worried and he said to his dad, I don't know how to plow a straight row. And dad said, look, look, look down the field. What do you see? And in typical young boy fashion, nothing. <laughs> now look down there. What do you see? Nothing. Finally, the dad said, do you see that fence down there? Oh, I see the fence. See that fence has certain posts there on the fence? And John says, his dad said to him, you start this tractor off and you lower that plow and you put one of those fence posts right in the middle of the hood. Just put a fence post with your eyes right in the middle of that hood. And you don't take your eyes off that fence post the whole way down. The father said to the boy, he said, there'll be some distractions. We all know about birds that start dive bobbing you when you're plowing up their nests, you know, and, and area. And these, they do it around here. You're cutting grass. Some of our guys have cut grass. You've got to wear a helmet out here. These birds come down on you so fast you're messing up their nests. And the dogs will start barking. And, and a neighbor will drive by in the car and beep and want you to wave. But the dad said, you get that fence post, you put it in the middle of that hood, and you do not look anywhere else but there. And John said, I did what my dad told me to do. I put it in the gear, I pulled out the clutch, I lowered that plow, and off I went down that row, and I, as, as intently as I could, with all of the distractions, and my right, dad was right, there were distractions, dirt going in your eye and everything, but I went down that row and I kept that fence post right in the middle of my hood. He said, when I got to the end, I looked back, and I had made the most perfect row, that first row. And the key was where he was looking. Where he was looking. There's a lot that the Bible says about where we look, about what we look at. And I believe that our following of Jesus Christ is dependent upon where we're looking. 
John learned a powerful truth about farming, but he also learned a powerful truth about life. When you're memorizing verses for a competition, there are some short verses that are high on the list to memorize. The number one verse to memorize in a verse memorizing competition is Jesus wept. If you can memorize Jesus wept, you got one verse down. Now there's another great verse that's easy to memorize. It's three words. Anybody remember the three word verse? Pray without ceasing is another one. Yeah, there, I guess there's a couple. There's another one. In the beginning, that's all. That's part of a verse. Remember Lot's wife. It's a three-word verse. Remember Lot's wife. Now that's peculiar, isn't it? Why remember her? She looked back. You know what's interesting about Lot's wife's story is she didn't go back to Sodom. Am I right? She didn't go back to Sodom. She just looked. And the moment she looked back at Sodom, she turned into a pillar of salt. I believe the devil wanted her to look back. I believe her flesh wanted to look back. I believe the devil wants us to look away. I believe he wants our eyes to get distracted. I believe he wants us to examine or ponder or consider or contemplate things that will move us away from the focus of Jesus Christ. In the book of Psalms, there was a psalmist named Asaph who got his eyes on something that distracted him. It's in Psalms chapter 74, I think, but Asaph says, I looked at the prosperity of the wicked. And he said, when I looked at the prosperity of the wicked, here's what he said, my feet had well nigh slipped. He said, I started looking away to something I shouldn't be looking at, and that's when I almost really tripped up, when I looked the wrong place. We've been studying the book of Joshua on Saturday mornings. I've loved it. It's been a fun time. And in studying the book of Joshua, we went through Achan, Achan was in the battle. He was in the fight. Bob taught this lesson, did an excellent job. Brought out some things that I had never thought of before. You know, when they fought, it was hand-to-hand, man-to-man, eyeball-to-eyeball. Today, we fight from miles and miles away. You push the button, the torpedo takes off. And many of our soldiers don't even see the eyeballs of the enemy, uh, eyes. But Achan was fighting with the armies of Israel, had a sword in his hand and, and, and fighting the, the enemy of, 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 uh, the, of the Canaanites who were dwelling in the land. They were being driven out. And in the midst of that fighting, when, when Achan should be focused on his comrades who needed him and his, his brothers who needed him, and he's in a fight, you know what he saw? This is what's interesting. Achan, by his own testimony, said, I saw a Babylonian garment. And I saw that wedge of gold, and he said, I took it. It was all about where he was looking when he was fighting. I don't know if I'd be in a battle like that where swords are being slung around all around me. Would you be looking for some clothes? I wouldn't be. I'd be focused on the battle. But somehow, some way, Achan got focused on a Bab- he called it a goodly Babylonian garment. And that's what he saw. It's easy sometimes to look at the wealth and the prosperity. Isn't our world so good at showing us prosperity? Uh, I felt a little guilty this morning. I don't know if you felt guilty. We were talking about it before church. When the pastor from Africa said, How could you as Americans, in your prayers about America, say anything but thank you, Lord? Did you catch that? It's coming from someone who's not from here. Someone who lives in another country that doesn't have what we have. And we go to our Heavenly Father and complain about this country. Complain about the ills that we have here, the high taxes we pay, and the 
property bills we, we're getting and the, you know, the way our Grafton Road is so bumpy. Did you notice that he mentioned several times our nice roads? Have you ever driven on a road in Africa? How many have driven on a road in a third world country? I know there's, or have ridden in a road on a third world country. I'm telling you, they, they are like landmines. They, they, you'll lose your car in some of those, literally. And we complain. We look at the prosperity. We see the good things that someone else has and wishes we had them. Sometimes we'll look at the world's relationships. I, I am so, so sickened by the way the world tells our young people how relationships should go. Be with anybody, live with anybody, sleep with anybody, do what you want, forget marriage. That's all that's on television and the media today. That's what's there. And we get our eyes on it. Samson saw a woman from Timnath. I won't have you turn there, but you know Samson. One of his big problems was not his, you know, he can open any can of pickles, any jar of pickles. But he had problems looking at women. He had problems keeping his eyes where they should be. And he saw a woman from Timnath, and you know the rest of Samson's story. What he saw took him right away from God. I guess I'm saying tonight in a very simple way, let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the Bible says, Hebrews 12, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame as it is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Peter got out of his boat and started walking to Jesus Christ. He was walking on water, and he started to sink. Some of you Bible readers know the, story, know the reason. It's because he's got his eyes off the Lord. And by his own testimony, he said, I started to see the wind and the waves, and I started to see the storm. I began to sink, sink because of where he was looking. It may be that the Christian is not following Christ as close as they could or should because they are looking other places. Have you ever tried to walk in a direction that you're not looking? I can tell some of you have. Our brother Jim jokes about uh, the, the, the smartphone. Do you have a smartphone yet, Jim? Okay, he has arrived. So everybody on the planet must have one if Jim has one by now. <laughs> he says uh, he's, seen, he's seen young people walking down the street like this. And in fact, we've heard the stories of people falling into a fountain, you know, falling off the sidewalk. Yeah, get hit by a car because you're, you're not looking where you want to go. Not looking where you want to go. Your eyes are distracted. The heart may want to follow Christ, but if you're not looking at Christ, you won't follow Christ. Does that make sense? We've got to be cautious and always aware of where we have been looking. Let me try to bring this to a point of application. I have seen in the ministry people begin to look hard at other things and it has caused them to abandon their pursuit of Christ. Well, I'm going to look into this homesteading thing. I'm going to get some animals. We're going to have a little farm here. We're going to put our things together. We're going to uh, do all of this, uh, this little off-the-grid kind of living. I've seen people do that and stop walking with Christ. You say, why? Did they not, did they not want to walk with Christ anymore? I don't think so. I think it's just they started looking another way. I've seen some become a product consultant. I'm going to sell, you name it. I'm going to sell a certain good. I'm going to have parties, and we're going to put this together, and we're going to, I'm going to jump into this with both feet, and, and hopefully I'll be able to get a, a pink Cadillac. And it's not that they wanted to stop following Christ, but they did stop following Christ because they were looking someplace else. Their eyes just came off the fence post. 
And when your eyes come off the fence post, your row ain't going to be straight. I'm going to take up photography. I'm going to jump into this photography thing, and, and certainly I'll be able to make some extra money. I'll, I'll photograph some uh, weddings, and maybe taking our eyes onto photography causes us to lose sight of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to look to sports, or I'm going to work at uh, my employment because there's a new promotion. Focusing on these things may distract us from following the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't want to push too hard tonight just looking at Jesus, rather than I want to say, let's not look at the other things. I believe that it is natural in the heart of a believer to want to look to Jesus Christ. I think it's part of being a believer. If someone says they're a Christian and does not want to follow the Lord, their Christianity is in question. Right? Because part of being a Christian means I'm following Jesus. He's my life. So what happens? What happens like in Luke chapter number uh, 9 where this person says, I'll follow you, but let me go first bury my dead. I'll follow you. Let me go first say goodbye to everybody at home. And Jesus said, no man having put his hand to that plow and just looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. I could preach tonight and say that we all need to look at Jesus, but I'm going to say it a different way. We need to stop looking at other things. Because when our eyes drift to other things, we won't be able to follow the Lord. I brought something with me for an illustration, and I'll close. I'm studying for this today. And uh, I was in the office, and I was at the desk, and I thought, I wonder if there's a baseball and a bat at my house. Then I thought, you idiot, you got five boys over there. There's a baseball and a bat somewhere in that house. <laughs> so I went over to our shed over here, and I found a baseball and a bat. They call this America's pastime. Maybe it's not America's pastime like it used to be. Um, but those of us that have played this sport and were taught to play this sport when we were young, there was a few things that helped us make it. When you were had the bat in your hand, you wanted to be, you know, Ty Cobb, Mickey Mantle. You wanted to slug it over the fence. And somebody in front of you would take this ball. Sometimes it's your dad and uncle. And as a little boy, you'll have this bat on your shoulder, and they'll take this ball, and in your mind, you're going you're gonna to knock the, 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 what do they call this? Uh, you're going to knock the skin? I know. Uh, yeah, the, uh, uh, you're going to. Stitches. You're, you're, you're going to bust the ball up. That's what you're thinking. Knock the skin off, the stitches up. And that ball comes your way, you're like, how hard can this be? And what happens? Swing and a miss. Massive swing and a miss. That's all right, that's all right. Try again, try again. Throw me the ball back. So you throw the ball back to dad, throw it back to your uncle. Try again, try again. And they toss you that ball underhand, just lobbing these, lobbing these, I mean, just lobbing these balls that are just like hanging there. Swing and a miss. Swing and a miss. And finally, the person pitching decides to give you some good advice. Look, man. Son, listen to me. You have to keep your eyes on the ball. Because when I was a boy, my eyes were on the fences. When that ball's coming in, I could care less about the ball. I'm looking at the end of 69th Street because that's where it's going. It's going out into the boulevard when I get a hold of this thing. And my eyes aren't on the ball, and I miss, and I miss, and I miss, and I miss. Jesus said this when these three guys wanted to follow him. That's great, you want to follow me. But you can't grab the plow and look back. Not talking about going back. You can't look back. And all I'm saying here tonight is we can't follow Christ when we've been tempted to look everywhere else. How are we going to follow the Lord? How are we going to follow the Lord when our minds and our eyes are focused on every other thing that this world has to offer? I 
parents would say when I was growing up, and I've said to my kids a hundred times, you better look where you're going. And maybe our reminder tonight is, if we want to follow Christ, let's look where we're going. Instead of all of these other things that distract us and get us off course. Let's bow our heads for a prayer tonight. Your feet will follow your eyes. Your heart will follow your eyes. So where are we looking tonight? We can so passionately want a relationship that we miss Jesus Christ. We can so passionately want a promotion at work that we miss Jesus Christ. Where are you looking? Where are we looking? It's just a time of invitation. It's a chance to pray. It's a time to digest and consider these scriptures. Asaph said, I saw the prosperity of the wicked and I just about slipped. My feet were just about out from under me just because of where he looked. Let's stand quietly and this is a chance for us to pray. If you want to kneel at your seat, you want to grab a loved one and pray. Young people want to pray tonight. Father, with their heads bowed and eyes closed, I believe it is, it is nestled in the heart of every single believer that desire to follow Christ. But it's so easy when the birds are dive bombing our heads and when the horns are beeping on the road, it's so easy for us to look away. And as we look away, our, our way just sort of goes a little astray. Father, I pray tonight that you would put a governing upon our eyes. Bless the invitation, I pray, for our church family. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Our heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Where he leads me, I will follow the song being played. Page number 350 in your book. Let's sing a few stanzas of this tonight. Will you come if you have a need, if you wish to pray tonight? I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take my cross and Follow, follow me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go. Can we do, I'd like for everybody to bow your heads for a moment. I want to do something a little bit different. Everyone's heads are bowed except for those that are 30 and younger. Would you please open your eyes if you're 30 and younger. Everyone else's heads are bowed. 30 and younger, you may open your eyes. Now those of you with your eyes still closed, our quote-unquote young people are looking. If you're older here tonight, and you'd be willing to raise your hand to this question. Was there a time in your life when you just got your eyes off the fence post? You didn't want to really do any harm in life, but it just seemed like something else caught your attention. And as far as your Christianity, for that span of time, you were just swinging and missing. Now, all young people are looking. And I think it'd be beneficial for us just to see the, the danger of this. 
If some of you older folks are like that, would you slip your hand up? I remember a time in my life when somehow my eyes just got off the Lord onto something else. Maybe it was my job. Maybe it was my car. Maybe it was my hobbies. Maybe it was my kids. I don't know what it was, but it just got off. Now, young people, look around. I just want you to know, young people, you start that tractor toward the Lord Jesus Christ and keep that fence post on that hood. You may put your hands down, church family. No man having put his hand to the plow and just looking back. You do that, you're not fit. Those of you that raised your hands a moment ago, would you say a prayer for these young people? Pray that they will not have to suffer the wasted months or years of an improper focus that God would spare them from that pray for them I can hear my Savior calling the song says I can hear my Savior calling Let's do the chorus together, and that will be all tonight. Will you join me on the chorus together, please? Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. I'll go with him, with him. All have your seats everyone tonight uh, this morning for the offering we had about a thousand dollars come in for the sound system for um, Pastor Philip the sound system was nineteen hundred dollars I wrote him the check for nineteen hundred believing that the rest will come in uh, tonight some of some people this morning said they weren't prepared this morning they wanted to give tonight so in this offering if you'll just designate it as such make sure that you somehow notate it that it's for that uh, sound system so we'll know uh, another blessing that I had this morning is I had someone come up to me and say, whatever the difference is, I'll pay it. So whatever doesn't come in, it will come in. God provides, doesn't he? And so I praise the Lord for that. Um, so give if you can. Uh, I, I wouldn't think anybody would be sitting in a chair thinking, well, then I don't have to give if they're going to cover the whole deal. You'll miss out on the blessing. When the gospel is going through those speakers, some of you that have been to a, uh, a foreign country, sometimes a third world, world nation, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. People don't live in houses. They live outside. We were talking about this. They live outside. They only sleep in the house. Maybe cook a little bit in the house. But when I was in Haiti and Africa, they're not living in those houses. Who would want to stay in there all day? Dirt floors, I mean, just, just tattered roofs, you know. So uh, I'll get Brother Earl in a second. So what they do is they all stay outside. We had VBS where we just went to a place, dirt field, started singing some songs, and before 10 minutes were up, we had 80 people sitting on the ground. I know what will happen. You use a sound system there to preach the gospel, a crowd will come and hear the gospel. And uh, if you'd like to have part of that, give something sacrificially tonight uh, as we uh, wanted to be a blessing to uh, the missionary. Brother Earl? Yes, sir. Yes. And nobody wants to stay in that all day. Yes. So they walk the streets out in the fields and... Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, some of you guys remember when it started to rain in Haiti? Since everybody's outside, they got to go under like the coverings of gas stations or wherever. Uh, big groups of people gathered there while, while, the, while it's raining. Um, just a different culture. But uh, thank you, church family, for giving. Could our ushers come, please, tonight as we'll uh, be able to participate in this offering? 
Okay, you can use your bulletin to see the announcements. Pray for Brother Townhill. He's, uh, he's got the flu. Uh, he's got the man flu. <laughs> Which is a much worse form of flu than the women get. Uh, of course. I mean, it's, it's debilitating. I mean, you're, you're just on the bed. I mean, it's done. You're through. So uh, all of us men know the man flu. And all women roll their eyes. Yeah, the man flu. I've seen that. <laughs> So Matt's got the man flu, and we'll pray that he recovers from that soon. Uh, so please uh, give generously tonight. Grady's going to do our offertory. Is he around here? He's ready. Come on up, Grady, if you would. He'll play our offertory for us. We'll have a prayer, and then the men will pass the plates. Okay? So let's do our prayer. Brother John, would you do it, please, tonight? Yes. And thank you for giving. Let's stand for our dismissal tonight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Grady. Good job. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. So we'll pray. Thank you for being here. It's just at 7 o'clock. Looked like the rain had stopped. So uh, uh, a dry going home, huh? Uh, so uh, we'll conclude with prayer and then be dismissed. Okay. So